Hello, everybody. Happy day. Happy day. I'm really excited about the Word of God that I get to share with you today. If you have a Bible, would you open it up to 1 John chapter 5? If you don't have your Bible with you, maybe push pause and go find it. Use whatever English translation is best for you, whatever works and is most helpful. I'm going to read from the English Standard Translation. If yours is a little different than mine, pay attention to how it's different, because actually that's going to help you understand God's Word with greater clarity. I'm going to read the first five verses, 1 John 5, 1 to 5, but verse 4, only verse that we're really going to pay attention to in this text. Here's God's Word. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? What I want you to notice in here, there's a lot of rich truth to notice in this passage, but notice in verse 4 that we overcome the world when we obey the Father, when we obey the Son, when we obey the moving of the Holy Spirit. There's this beautiful relationship in God's Word between my, my faith in Jesus Christ and the way I live that faith out by doing what He says. When I obey Jesus, not only am I pleasing the Father and I'm showing love for the Father, but I'm actually practicing, I'm living out the victory of God. Now you think of this from the Bible, we remember this, that before we were in Christ, we couldn't obey God. We couldn't please God before Jesus Christ uh, was our Lord and our Savior. The Bible says that inwardly we were dead, we were separated from the life of God, we were without hope. And while we might have been religious... And we might have tried to do good things, and we might have tried to be loving. The reality is, not only was our sin an incrossable barrier that separated us from God, but our sin became a type of um, pollutant, a type of toxicity that ultimately poisoned everything we did. So not only did our sin stop us from living an obedient life to God, showing love to God and loving other people, actually, our sin also kept us in bondage or captivity to the evil one. We were part of a larger anti-God movement, which here in John chapter 5, he refers to as the world. I, I read about this lighthouse in Australia on the south, the southern side of Australia in the, uh, uh, on a large peninsula that jutted into the Tasman Sea. It was built in 1857. Lots of dangerous rocks along the coast. The ships needed something to help them steer out of danger. For reasons that are still a bit of a mystery, the person responsible for engineering and architecting and building the lighthouse it appears that he made the decision where to put the lighthouse, which is kind of a big deal in the lighthouse world. He made the decision on where to put the lighthouse, uh, not based on what was good for the ships, but it seems he made that decision based on what was convenient for him as a builder, like how close it was to the quarry and how accessible it would be with the tide. I mean, he built, uh, no doubt, a delightful lighthouse, phenomenal and wonderful. The problem was it was in the wrong spot. The lighthouse, which was supposed to protect ships, actually lured ships to their destruction. In a 40-year span, almost two dozen ships were destroyed because of the poor messaging, if you will, of the, uh, of the lighthouse that was placed in the wrong spot. And the world, according to John, the world is like a lighthouse that sends out deceitful messages. Like a lighthouse that leads people away from God, there's a system of thinking, there's a value system, there's a cultural thought, the world, that, that draws us away from God. And when we're not in Christ, 
We're in the world. We're just a part of that system. But now, as believers, because we trust that Jesus Christ, in fact, is the ruling Son of God, because we put our faith in Him to be the solution for our sin problem, our faith in the objective work of Jesus, we're relying on His victory, it shifts something significant. No longer is our sin an uncrossable barrier between us and God, and no more does, does the evil one, the enemy of our soul, have an authority over us. We can, to borrow the words of verse 4, we overcome the world. In this world, you'll have trouble. John 16, 33. In this world, you'll have trouble, but take heart, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. Faith, you see this in, at the end of verse 4? What is it that, uh, let me read this to you. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And what the Bible's teaching us is that Jesus, through his death and resurrection, has broken the power of sin, has broken the power of the enemy, of our soul. And when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, faith is, um, it's how the victory of Jesus becomes translated into our life. So faith, if you think of it, this is kind of a, um, an odd comparison, but faith is like an extension cord. Faith is, everybody has faith. Everybody has faith. An atheist has faith in the philosophy of secular humanism. A materialist has faith in the acquisition of the next product or the next experience. As devoted followers of Jesus, we're fully convinced that his resurrection and him ruling at the right hand is, is what's the most real and the most true thing in the whole universe. Faith is like an extension cord, but not everybody plugs their faith into the same outlet. So let me use this imagery a little bit more. If faith is an extension cord, Jesus is the source of power, and our relying on Jesus, our faith, is the way that the power and the life of the risen Jesus is energized, is funneled into our life. Trusting in Jesus, plugging ourselves into Jesus, it means his victory is now our victory. Jesus overcame sin, we now overcome sin and the work of Satan. Let me read verse 4 one more time. For everyone who's been born of God, by the way, that phrase, born of God, this is the eighth time John uses it in this tiny little letter. For everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. The world is the lighthouse that's calling you to, to rebel against God, to do whatever you want. To No, no, no. Plugged into Jesus, we overcome the systems that lead us away from God. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Our faith. The Bible says that faith comes from hearing the word of God. Some of you are already starting plants in your window. You've taken the dry seeds and you've put them in the soil. The soil is warming up. It's probably warmer than 55 degrees because that seems to be a magic temperature for a lot of seeds. The seed warms up. The soil warms up the seed. You pour water on it. Somehow the water soaking into seed, the temperature of the soil, they work together and germination happens. And in our life, we have faith because the word of God and the Spirit of God together have birthed something in us. We have faith. We receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. John chapter 1, verse 12. Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does a work of regeneration in us. Something is born in us that wasn't there. Something comes alive. We come alive to God. And this faith that, that wakes us up, this faith that, that, that activates the life of God in us, this faith is how the power of God is repeatedly, continually for the rest of our life, how it keeps us connected to God and gives us the victory over every temptation, gives us victory over every sin. Every time the evil one's trying to entice us away, it, we, we walk in victory. Because in faith, the power of Jesus, the objective victory of Jesus on the cross becomes a real-time source of energy, of power in our life. I read a story about Harry Houdini. He was a very famous escape artist, early 1900s. 
He took a challenge. There was a new prison built in London. It had the latest technology of its day. And they were going to lock him in a prison cell to see if he could escape. He couldn't resist the temptation to show how good he was. So the guards, as, before they take him up to the, to the new prison cell, they search him thoroughly for lockpicks. They check his clothes. In fact, they take away as much of his clothes as they can to avoid any hiding spots for lockpicks. Now, what they didn't know, this is kind of junior high cool, but disgusting at the same time as, and please don't do this. He would swallow lockpicks so he could hide them somewhere in his esophagus, and then he would just kind of hack them back up when he needed them. In fact, that's what he did. They, they, they put him in the cell. And they've done all the checking, making sure he had no lockpicks. The guards leave. He hacks up the lockpick. The lock is on the outside of the door, so he's reaching through. He's, he can't see it, so he's listening to hear the tumblers click, and the minutes go past, and it's just not, the door's not unlocking. And minutes turn into hours, and I mean, he's starting to sweat, maybe panic, Maybe he's imagining these headlines, world's greatest escape artist fails. He is working and working and working and finally he kind of gets to the spot of, uh, of giving up and he just leans against the door and it opened. Not kidding, he wrote about this in his journal. No one knew about this till after he died. Apparently the guards, in their great effort to make sure he didn't have any locks, lock, you know, picks hidden on his person, they actually forgot to lock the door of the jail cell. The whole time, he's feverishly trying to unlock a door that was already unlocked. And I think about the story of Harry Houdini unlocking an unlocked door. In, in the Jesus Christ, because you've been born again, Jesus Christ has opened up a door. You have been set free from the sin and guilt that controlled you. You've been released from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of the Son of God. John, in, in, in chapter 5, verse 19, if you read down a little bit farther in John, it says that Satan... Well, actually, let me read this to you. Well, let me start at verse 18. It says, We know that everyone who's been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who has been born of God protects him. But he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. You see what happens when the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, you're born again? You've been released from the enemy's clutches. He has no authority over you. We know, like verse 19, we know that we are from God, and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. One of the things that motivates me from this passage is to challenge you as a child of God, as one who's been regenerated, to stop living like you're locked in the jail cell. To stop living like the enemy has some measure of control over you. And I want to challenge you to walk in obedience. Your obedience to Jesus, when you rebel against the systems of the world, the thought, the mindset, the philosophy of the world, when you see that lighthouse of the world and you say, it's calling me to turn this way, but no, I'm not going to live like I belong in the kingdom of darkness. When you rebel against the system of the world, you are, well, let me say it this way, your obedience to God is the ultimate act of social and spiritual rebellion. It's holy rebellion. And we can do this because Jesus Christ has won and our faith in his objective victory, it brings the victory of Jesus as he rules in heaven and it operates in our life now. Listen, I could do this. I could make a list. A sordid and scandalous and rather entertaining list of the ways in which I am struggling to obey Jesus. I could make you a, a list of the most common sins I fall into. And just actually, just this week, I had, to, I had to connect with one of my close spiritual brothers and say, Listen, I, I need to tell you something. I swung and missed here. I had to confess an area of sin because I didn't want the enemy to get a foothold. I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. Like, oh. I told this brother in Christ, I actually told my wife, owned up like this, because I, I don't want this thing, I, I don't want this mold or mildew starting to reproduce in my soul. And one way we could think about the Christian life, one perspective, I think the enemy, a perspective he wants, is though Jesus, Jesus Christ has opened the door of the cell, he wants us to spend all our time trying to pick the, pick the lock of a door that's already been opened. 
And sometimes I think the enemy wants to say, hey, Ben, look how big that mountain is you have let climb. Ben, look how much you fail God. Ben, look at how often you still sin in this area. Look at the ways you don't obey God. Look at the ways you aren't loving other people. And from that perspective, it's pretty discouraging. But I take 1 John, and, and, and there's, there's a different mindset for me as a believer. And part of the mindset is, listen, I have, I, Jesus has already won. I've already been declared the winner. The rest of my Christian life, I'm just living out of victory that's already been established. And one of the ways that, that kind of the rubber meets the road implication here is, is that as a Christian, all I need to do is win the moment that I'm in. Like right now, I just have to stay sober right in this moment. I don't have to wonder, can I stay sober for a year and five years? No, no, just, just in the moment. In this moment, I can think charitable thoughts towards a person who has hurt me significantly and I just would wish revenge and I want to hold a grudge and I, I just want to salivate in bitterness. But no, just in the moment, right now, think thoughts of grace and peace and blessing and pray favor in their life. Just in the moment, win the temptation just now. In the moment, direct my mind away from lust. In the moment, be content instead of gluttonous. You see what I'm saying? It's in the moment. All, the only victory I need to win is right now. And because I'm plugged into Jesus, because by faith I'm receiving the life and victory that Jesus won, it's the moment I can win. So do this. Focus on defying the powers and the patterns of this rebellious world. I want to read a Bible verse to you. And uh, for those of you that are watching, perhaps you would pause and just let the Spirit of God do some assessment in your soul. And begin asking the question, Lord... How often do I actually follow the blinking lights of the world's lighthouse? Risen Jesus, am I actually relying on you for the in this moment victories that you want me to? Like, like am I relying on you like you want me to? We're going to take a moment. Let me read this verse. You're going to pause for a moment. And then I've asked Amy, Pastor Amy, to share part of a lesson that she gave our junior hires. They're going through the Lord's Prayer. There's a section in the Lord's Prayer that says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. And she has some very practical coaching for them on when you get to those crosswords in, crossroads in the moment, how do you win the moment when you're being tempted to say, obey God, not obey God? So before we get there, let me read this verse and then we're just going to pause. God's word, Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Paul says, not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. So Father, I pray for my friends, even in this pause, Holy Spirit, are we living in the victory? Have we taken hold of everything that Jesus has won for us? God, are you seeing the moment by moment victories in our life? Or do you want to circle some crossroads and say, hey, quit taking the wrong turn there. I got something better. Holy Spirit, speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Temptation is a word that we often hear in the Bible, but what exactly does it mean? Temptation is a strong desire to have or to do something that is likely bad, wrong, or unwise. Some temptations, like wanting an extra piece of chocolate cake after dinner, might not be the height of evil, but we know it would be unwise. But there are other temptations, you know, all the examples we think about when we hear the word temptation. Those are the things that we know are wrong and hurtful to those around us and to ourselves. Those kinds of things don't match up to the character and nature of God and what he desires for us. That means giving into temptations like those is sin. James chapter 1 verses 14 and 15 affirm this by saying, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, 
gives birth to death. Now, here's an important thing to remember. Feeling the pull of temptation happens to us all. Jesus himself was tempted in the desert by Satan in Matthew chapter 4. It's giving in to temptation that leads us into sin. And every time we feel the pull of temptation, we come to a crossroads. Temptation is that intersection between obeying God or disobeying him. We have a serious choice to make, whether to obey God and walk down the path he has set for us, or to disobey and walk down the path of sin. As people who know and love Jesus and know that he is the source of life, we want to be overcomers. We want the strength and the power to overcome temptation and to choose what is right. But the big question is, how? How can we overcome temptation? Now, today, I've got four strategies for, for us from the Bible to help us do that. The first strategy is this. Simply, ask God for help. When Jesus' disciples asked him how to pray, Jesus prayed a simple but meaningful prayer that guides us on what to pray for. The last line of this prayer goes like this. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus himself taught us that it's wise to ask God for help in the battle against temptation. When you're feeling the pull of temptation, just stop and ask God for help. He wants you to succeed in overcoming temptation. So he is going to be eager to answer your prayer. And listen to this out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. What an encouragement. God promises to give us a way out so we don't have to succumb to temptation. The second strategy is this, guard our hearts. A great way to overcome temptation is to make sure that you're staying away from it in the first place. Keeping things away from our hearts and our minds is a wise way to avoid the perils of temptation. So what exactly does that look like? Maybe it means choosing never to step into a bar if you're tempted by alcohol. Maybe it means choosing to set rating limits on your television so that you don't see programs filled with adult images and suggestive themes that you know tempt you. Here's a third strategy to help us overcome temptation. Depending on God's word. Keeping ourselves immersed in God's word is another wise way to overcome temptation. In Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was tempted by Satan, he combated all of Satan's offers with scripture, with God's word, reminders of the truth. When we study God's word, we're keeping the truth close to our hearts. Sin will tempt us with its claims of pleasure and satisfaction. But God's word reminds us that sin is a liar. Sin will not satisfy. Only God satisfies. And his, his word reminds us of that truth. Study God's word faithfully and frequently and find strength in its truth in your battle to overcome temptation. A final strategy to look at in overcoming temptation is to seek help and accountability from your brothers and sisters in Christ. Galatians chapter 6 tells us to bear one another's burdens to help each other in times of trouble. When you're struggling with temptation, seek help from others. What does accountability look like? Maybe it's meeting with a wise and trusted Christian to discuss candidly whether you treated your family well this week 
or whether you gave in to anger. Maybe it's having your internet browsing history sent to a trusted accountability partner for review. Maybe it's having someone to call when the temptation to stew in anxiety and worry is just too strong. We've looked at four strategies today to help us overcome temptation. Build these strategies into your daily life and practice. And the next time when you come to the crossroads of temptation, they will help you overcome and choose the path that God has called you to.